Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering cardiac nursing. If you haven't done so, I know it's the beginning of the video, but I promise you're going to love this video. So go ahead, do it now. Like and subscribe. Like this video, subscribe to this channel, press that red notification button so you'll be notified every time a new video is released. Okay, guys, before we get started, you know I always start off with a prayer. If you're not into that, just go ahead and fast forward. If you are, close your eyes and bow your heads. Father God, thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. Thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for the breath of life in our bodies, Father God. Lord, I want to thank you for every single nursing student that will be graduating this summer, Father God, that you carried them through that nursing program. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Father God, thank you for every single viewer that's watching this video, Lord. I ask that you please help them to understand the information that's going to be covered, to be able to retain the information that's going to be covered, and Father God, to be able to critically think through these types of questions and these concepts. Thank you for all you've done in our lives and all you continue to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, guys, let's get started. First question. To determine the status of a... To determine the status of a client's carotid pulse, the nurse should palpate one below the mandible, two in the lateral neck region, three along the clavicle at the base of the neck, or four at the anterior neck lateral to the trachea. And guys, the correct answer is four. At the anterior front, anterior neck, lateral to the trachea. Trachea is here, lateral to the trachea. So, Here's the front of the neck, lateral to trachea, and guys, you'd be checking that parotid pulse right here, okay? So number four is the correct answer. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. Next question. During an auscultation of the heart, the nurse express, expects the first heart sound, S1, to be the loudest at the one, base of the heart, two, apex of the heart, three, lateral left lateral border, or four, right lateral border. And guys, the correct answer is two, apex of the heart. That S1, remember guys, you have a lub, a dub, lub, dub, lub, dub. S1 is your lub, dub is your S2. So they're asking about the S1, the correct answer is number two, at the apex of the heart. That's where the mitral valve and that tricuspid valve close at the same time. That's what you're hearing, okay? So number two is the correct answer. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, base of the heart. The base of the heart, that's where you hear the dub, your S2. That is closure of the aortic and the pulmonic valve. And remember, guys, they close at the same time. It's simultaneous. Um, choice number three and four are just wrong. When they're asking about that S1, that lub sound that you're hearing, the correct answer, again, guys, number two, apex of the heart. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. I'm getting over a really bad cold. When auscultating the client's heart, the nurse understands that the first heart sound is produced by closure of the, and I gave you guys the answer already, so you should know this. One, mitral and tricuspid valve. Two, aortic and tricuspid valve. Three, mitral and pulmonic valves. Or four, aortic and pulmon pul pulmonic valves. You guys should all get this right. I gave you the answer when I was explaining the first question. Okay, guys, and the correct answer is number one. The closure of the mitral and tricuspid valves. Remember, they close sim simultaneously, and that's where you hear what? That S1, the lub, okay? Now, let's look at our wrong answer choices. Two, aortic and tri uh, tricuspid valves. Um, these, again, guys, uh, don't close at the same time, so there's no way that that would have made your S1 your lub. They don't even close at the same time. Choice three, your mitral and pulmonic valve. These don't close at the same time. Choice four, the aortic and pulmonic valves. Yes, they do close at the same time. But remember, guys, these make your dub sound, your S2, not your S1. So that's why number one is your correct answer choice. When assessing an 85-year-old client's vital signs, the nurse anticipates a number of changes in cardiac output that results from the aging process. The finding that is consistent with pathological condition rather than aging process is one, a pulse rate irregularity, two, an equal apical and radial pulse, three, pulse rate of 60 beats per minute, or four, an apical rate obtainable at the fifth intercostal space. And guys, the correct answer is one. 
a pulse rate irregularity. So the question's asking us for something that's pathological. What does that mean when we see that word pathological? That means illness, right? It's not something naturally that's well, I shouldn't use that word naturally, but it means illness, something's wrong. So number one's the correct answer because dysrhythmias, that is not normal part of aging of the heart, okay? That's abnormal. So that's why we chose this answer. Now let's look at the, our other choices. Two, equal apical and radial pulse. That's a good thing. That doesn't um, reflect anything that's pathological. That's good. Choice three, a pulse rate of 60 beats per minute. Well, your pulse is supposed to be 60 to 100. So that's a good thing. That doesn't reflect anything that's pathological. Choice four, an apical rate obtainable at the fifth intercostal space, midclavicular line. That's good, guys. That's taking that apical um, um, uh, pulse that you're listening to that heartbeat where? At the apex of the heart. That is good. So the only thing that's irregular, the only thing that can show possible illness or pathological would be number one, a dysrhythmia, having a heart irregularity. That is not normal in aging. <coughs> Excuse me. Thrombus formation is a danger for all postoperative clients. The nurse should act independently to prevent this complication. Check all that applies. So guys, we're going to choose select all that apply. Remember guys, when we're doing select all that apply, you have to treat them as true or false. Each option independently. If it's true, you're going to keep it. If it's false, you throw it out. So let's go. One, urging the client to drink more fluids. False. Here's why. This patient's post-op, we don't know. Let me go back to the question. Yes, uh, their post-op, we don't know post-op what. We don't know if that patient's NPO. So we can't encourage them to drink fluids or even eat anything until we have an order for it. That's not something we can do independently on our own without an order. That's why it's false. Choice two, massa massaging the client's extremities with lotion. Look at me in my eyeball when I say this to you so you don't ever forget. You never, ever, 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 ever massage a client's extremity. Because what happens is if they did have a clot, you just dislodged it and you caused them to possibly have a what? Pulmonary embolism. Absolutely not. So that's a no-no. Choice three, placing the client's legs in pneumatic stockings false. You cannot do that without an order. That is not something that you can do independently, that you as a nurse can do autonomously. Absolutely not. Choice four, encouraging the client to keep the legs uncrossed. True. You don't need an order for that. And you should teach that patient not to cross their legs because you don't want to put pressure on that vein and you want to make sure you increase uh, venous circulation, not decrease it, not impede it. So absolutely, you're gonna tell them not to cross their legs and you don't need an order to teach that to the patient. Choice five, instructing the client to dorsiflex the feet routinely. True, absolutely true. You should teach that to the patient. It will and can help prevent clots and increase venous return and you don't need an order for that. So the correct answer, guy, is is four and five because those are the only choices that you as a nurse can do independently without an order. Oxygen by nasal cannula is prescribed for a client in the coronary unit. The nurse plans to use safety precautions in the room because oxygen one is flammable, two supports combustion, three has unstable properties, four converts to an alternate form of matter. <coughs> Sorry, guys, if I waited until I got better to make these videos for you, you'd be about a month without videos or three weeks. Okay, guys, so the correct answer is two, supports, su supports, support, supports combustion. That's the only correct answer, guys. So a fire cannot live for any amount of time without oxygen. It needs oxygen to keep going, so it does support combustion. All of the other choices are wrong. One is flammable. Oxygen doesn't burn. It just supports the fire when it's burning. That's what keeps the fire alive, but oxygen itself doesn't burn. So how is it flammable? Choice three has unstable properties. Choice four converts to an alternate form of matter. What? 
No. Choice number two is the only correct answer. Like I said, uh, fire has to have oxygen in order to keep going. And that's why when there's a fire, you do what? Close the doors. You want to shut off the oxygen supply to try to get that fire to burn out or to die. <coughs> when interpreting an ECG rhythm strip, the nurse identifies that ventricular contraction is displayed as the one P wave, two T wave, three PR interval or four QRS interval. Okay guys, and the correct answer is, let me look at choices, four QRS interval. So that represents the time taken for depolarization of both of the ventricles, okay? So the correct answer is number four. Now let's look at the wrong choices. We have one where it says P wave, that's actually repolarization of what? Both of the atrias, not the ventricles, the atrias. Um, two, the T waves, that's repolarization of what? Both of the ventricles. Now, don't get confused because you see two where it says T waves, that's repolarization of the ventricles. But our answer, which is number four, the QRS, that's D polarization of the ventricles make sure you guys do not get those two confused and our last one guys uh one two three our pr interval that's the time that it takes for that impulse to spread throughout the atria okay so our correct answer here is number four qrs interval next question a thallium scan is scheduled for a client who had a myocardial infarction Two, one, monitor the mitral and aortic valves. Two, establish viability of myocardial muscle. Three, visualize ventricular systole and diastole. Or four, determine the adequacy of electrical conductivity. So why are we giving this thallium scan? <coughs> <clears throat> and guys, the correct answer is to establish the viability of myocardial muscle. Here's the thing. Um... Dead tissue is not going to pick up that um that 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 scan that isotope. It's not going to pick up that isotope. So that's how we're able to visualize and see what tissue is actually viable, which tissue is alive, which tissue is working, and which one's really just dead in the chronic. Okay. Um, choice number one: monitor the mitral and aortic valves. That's actually. For that, we would do a cardiac cath with angiography, okay? Number three, visualize the ventricular systole and diastole. Same thing, same thing, guys. We would do a cardiac cath with angiography. And then choice four, determine the adequacy of electrical conductivity. Simple 12 lead ECG. So for this question, our correct answer, guys, is number two. After traumatic accident, a client's admitted to the hospital's emergency department for blood pressure of 100 over 60, and the practitioner suspects a ruptured spleen. The nurse should assess the client for an early sign of decreased arterial pressure, such as one, weak radial pulse, two, warm flush skin, three, lethargy with confusion, or four, increased pulse pressure. And guys, the correct answer is one, weak radial pulses. A ruptured spleen, that's an organ that has ruptured. We expect that patient is going to be going into shock. We're going to see that heart rate go up, the blood pressure go down, and those peripheral pulses are going to be what? Weak and thready, number one. Now, let's look at our wrong answer choices. Two, warm flesh skin. How's that skin going to look and feel? It's going to be cool and pale. Why? Because of that vasoconstriction. Remember, your body's going to try to survive excuse me, no matter what. So once you start losing all that blood, automatically your vessels are going to what? Start constricting because it's going to try to bring that blood pressure back up. It's going to try to hold on to the to the fluid that it has, right? So we, because of that vasoconstriction that you expect to see happening, the skin's going to be cool and pale, not warm and flushed. Look at number three, a lethargy with confusion. That's actually a later sign of hypovolemic shock. And choice four, increased pulse pressure. What do we expect that pulse pressure to do? 
go down, not go up. So guys, number one is our correct answer. A male client has a dystectomy infusion for a herniated nucleus pulpus, HNP, pulposa, excuse me. When getting out of bed for the first time with assistance from two nurses, the client complains of feeling faint and lightheaded. One nurse instructs the client to one, sit on the edge of the bed so they can hold him upright. Two, slide to the floor so he will not fall and hurt himself. Three, lie down immediately so they can take his blood pressure. Four, bend forward because it'll increase the blood flow to his brain. And guys, the correct answer is number one. Let's talk about this. So let's say you didn't understand what was happening here, that the patient was having orthostatic hypotension, right? And we know patients having orthostatic hypotension. You want them to what? Dangle. You gonna have them sit on the side of the bed, dangle their legs anyway, right? So their blood pressure doesn't drop too fast as they're getting up. Let's say you didn't catch that. How did you not catch that the patient just had a discectomy discectomy and fusion for herniated nucleus pulposus. What does that tell us? That tells us that we definitely need to keep that spinal column aligned. So we can't do anything that will cause flexion or uh, um, misalignment of that spinal cord. Look at choices two, three, and four. Slide, look, choice two, slide them to the floor. You're flexing that vertebrae. Why would you do that? Number one, when you could have just had them on the bed. Two, lie down immediately. You having them lie down so fast, you absolutely can flex um, that vertebrae. And number two, having them lie down immediately can make that orthostatic hypotension even worse. Choice number four, bend. Are we bending anything on this patient as far as their spinal column is concerned? Absolutely not. Look at the um, diagnosis that the patient has. Look at the surgery that they just had. So the only correct answer, guys, here is number one. A man experiences crushing chest pain and is brought to the emergency department. When assessing the ECG tracing, the nurse concludes that the client is experiencing premature ventricular complexes, PVCs. Which abnormalities of the electrocardiogram support this conclusion? One, irregular rhythm, abnormal shape P wave, normal QRS. Two, irregular rhythm, absence of a P wave, wide distorted QRS. Three, regular rhythm, more than 100 beats per minute, normal P wave, normal QRS. Or four, regular, regular rhythm, 100 to 250 beats per minute, absent P wave, wide distorted QRS. Guys, if you're still watching this video, thank you so much for rocking with me because I'm sick as a dog and I've been coughing all over this video. So thank you guys. I appreciate it. Okay, so the correct answer, guys, is two. Irregular rhythm, no P wave, and a wide distorted QRS. That is your classic PVC. Write it down. That is your classic PVC. Now let's look at our wrong answer choices. We have one, an irregular rhythm, abnormal shape P wave, and a normal Q QRS. That's your premature what? Atrial complex. That's your premature atrial complex. Choice three, regular rhythm, more than 100 beats per minute, normal P wave, and normal QRS. That's your sinus. What does sinus mean? Normal, right? Sinus, tachycardia. Look, more than 100 beats per... Everything's normal, but the beat is too high. It's more than 100. Your beat's supposed to be 60 to 100. So that is just showing us sinus tachycardia. <coughs> Excuse me. And lastly, regular rhythm, 100 to 250 beats per minute, no P wave, wide distorted QRS. What is that? VTAC, ventricular tachycardia. So for this question, guys, our correct answer is number two. A female client tells the nurse that the physician just told her that her triglycerides and cholesterol are excessively elevated. The client appears discouraged and says, well, I guess I'd better cut out all the fat and cholesterol in my diet. What is the nurse's most appropriate response? One, well, yes, that will certainly lower the amount of your your blood fats. Two, that's good, but be sure to compensate by adding more carbohydrates. Three, 
You need some fat to supply the necessary fatty acids, so it's mainly just a need for cutting down the amount. Or four, you need some, cholest some cholesterol in your diet because your body cannot manufacture it, so just avoid excessive amounts. And guys, the correct answer is number three. You need some fat to supply the necessary fatty acids. Why? The fatty acids are important for the tissues, okay? That's what we need it for, especially when I say tissue. Um, let me take that word tissue back, muscles. Those fatty acids are needed for muscles, especially what muscle? We're talking about cardiology. So what muscle do you think I'm talking about? The cardiac muscle, okay? So it's mainly just the need for cutting down the amount. So you need it, you just need to cut down the amount because yes, it's needed for muscle, especially, you know, heart muscle, but it can also cause some other heart disease. So you just need it. You, your body needs it, but not too much of it. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, well, yes, that will certainly lower the amount of your blood fats. Well, yes, that will certainly lower the amount of your blood fats. Um, all fats shouldn't and couldn't be eliminated. Even if you want to, you couldn't eliminate 100%, but it should not. Like I said, your body needs it for tissues, especially muscles, okay? Two, that's good. Be sure to compensate by adding more carbohydrates. Um, carbs don't have fatty acids, and it's the fatty acids that help with those tissues and muscles. So that's wrong. Then choice four, you need some cholesterol in your diet because your body cannot manufacture it. So um, just avoid excessive amounts. Your body cannot make cholesterol. Your body cannot make cholesterol. <coughs> and so guys, the correct answer is number three. I'm gonna pause this video for a moment. I have to get some water. I'll be right back. Okay, guys, I'm back. This is a judge-free zone. I know I said I was gonna get some water, but. Moving on. The nurse concludes that the gradual occlusion of the internal or common carotid arteries manifested TIAs may occur because of one, acquired valvular heart disease, two, atherosclerosis of the vascular system, three, emboli associated with AFib, or four, developmental defects of the arterial wall. And guys, the correct answer is two, atherosclerosis of the vascular system. So they gave us some cues to let us know that they're talking about these fatty plaques that have really occluded these arteries. If you go back to the question, it says gradual. How many times have I told you guys about a risk factor for atherosclerosis is just age. The older that you get, the longer that you've been living on this earth, eating pizza and cheeseburger and french fries and all these fatty foods and those that cholesterol, that fat just kind of clumps up on your arteries and it starts to occlude it. It's not something that happens overnight. That's why you don't see little kids with high cholesterol, right? So that's number one. And number two, TIAs. What usually um, um, can cause those TIAs? Come on, guys. Okay, very good. So that fat, that cholesterol clogging those arteries, so that's what leads us to atherosclerosis of the vascular system. That's the only correct answer here. Okay, we have a select all that apply coming up. A client's diet is modified to eliminate foods that act as cardiac stimulants. What should the nurse teach the client to avoid select all that apply? How do we treat select all that apply? As true or false? Let's go. One, iced tea. True. Why? Because tea has caffeine and caffeine absolutely is a cardiac stimulant. Two, red meat. False. Red meat's high in cholesterol, but it's not a cardiac stimulant. Three, club soda. False. Club soda's high in sodium, but it's not a cardiac stimulant. Choice four, hot cocoa. True, because cocoa has what in it? Chocolate. What's in chocolate? Caffeine. Choice four, chocolate pudding. Well, I just told you the answer, true. Yes, because we know the caffeine's in chocolate. 
So the correct answer is one, four, and five. A man's brought to the emergency department by coworkers and is admitted with a possible myocardial infarction. Several hours later, the client's experiencing severe chest pain. He's diaphoretic and has a pulse rate of 110 beats per minute. The nurse should immediately, one, increase oxygen flow, two, obtain blood pressure and electrocardiogram, three, notify the practitioner and administer ordered morphine, or four, administer ordered nitro tablet until the pain subsides. And guys, the correct answer is three. You're going to let that physician know. You're going to give them that ordered morphine. Then you're going to give them the oxygen and everything else. But the first thing you're going to do, guys, is going to be your number three. Notify the doctor of what's going on so you can get some more orders and then go ahead and give um, uh, um, that uh, morphine and uh, go ahead and increase that oxygen flow as ordered. Okay? Um. Wow, we're already down to our last question. All right, guys. The nurse plans to teach a client receiving a two gram sodium restricted diet that the foods lowest in sodium are one, meat and fish, two, fruit and juices, three, milk and cheese, or four, dry cereals and grains. Lowest in sodium. And guys, the correct answer is two, fruits and juices. So um, fresh meat and fish are higher in sodium, but especially if it's, um, what's the word I'm looking for when, when it's packaged, like uh, um, meats that are like um, deli meats. I can't think of the word, but like if it's like packaged meat, preserved meat, it's even going to be higher in sodium. Anything that comes packaged in a box that has preservative, it's going to be higher in sodium. I can't think of the word. It'll come to me. Process. Any um, meats that are processed. So first of all, if it's fresh, it's going to be higher in sodium. But if it's processed, it's going to be extremely high in sodium. So it's not number one. Three, milk and cheese, especially like aged cheeses, higher in sodium, and your cereals, they're higher in sodiums than fruit and juice. So that's why uh, number two is the correct answer. Guys, that's the end of this video. Thank you so much for sticking by me throughout this entire video. Um, if you've been following my videos before, you know I've been out of town for the past couple weeks. I've been sick, but I'm getting better. So thank you so much for rocking with me. Um, let me know in the comments what you thought about this video, what, if you'd like to see more cardio. And if there's a specific type of cardio that you'd like to see me cover, go ahead, sound off in the comments on that as well. Don't forget, you can find me on TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Please do not forget to like and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching this video, and you'll see me on the next video.